we're going to we're going to have several presentations by various individuals. We have city officials here. We have school officials. Both school districts are here, and um, we're going to talk about a lot of topics. What I'm going to suggest is that we wait and take questions at the end of all the presentations, because my guess is a lot of your questions will be answered sometime during the presentation. So we'll take questions at the end. So you know, put them on your phone or jot them down on a piece of paper, or if you have a good memory, try to remember those. Um, and we will also be taking questions on Facebook Live. We have uh, Drew Riss back there who is doing the production, and we have Denise Perrin who is helping us with the Facebook Live um, feed. She'll be answering questions on Facebook Live as people ask them. Not that she's going to be answering public safety questions, she's just going to be answering questions that she potentially, and she'll be relaying questions to us also at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, one of the stars of the recent Rowlett lip sync video. <laughs> if you haven't seen that, you are not part of the 2.2 million that have seen that. Um, but before I do that, I was waiting for these guys to, to come in. One of the exciting things we did uh, recently is we started a new youth council. So we have a city council, and that's made up of you know, individuals 18 to, who's the oldest on our council? I won't say that out loud. Uh, <laughs> brownie. Um, but we started a new thing this year called our youth council. And our youth council is, going to, uh, is made up of uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors in GISD. And they had their first meeting tonight, and then we invited them for this presentation. So I'm not going to introduce them all, but if you would please stand up if you are a member of the Youth Council. And I would like everybody in the audience to give these guys a round of applause. We, we had a limited number of positions, and this isn't all of them, but it's a lot of them. We had a limited number of positions and we had applicants. We had like over 35 applicants. Our youth are the future of this country and they are great. And I am so proud um, that we have started this uh, youth council and I'm so happy that you all view it a priority in your life and that you're um, helping us with this. So now without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our, our first speaker who is uh, Chief Brodnick. So Mike, if you would come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all for spending the evening with us and taking your time. School safety is, is definitely the topic in, the, in America right now. And I like to break it down into two categories, is proactive and, pre and uh, proactive and reactive. And some of the things that we do in policing is both proactive and reactive. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is advanced law enforcement rapid response training, which we call alert. Several years back, for when I was first in policing, when I was on the TAC team and everything, the response to any active shooter scenario anywhere, school, business, anywhere, was we all got to the location and we waited for SWAT to get there. Patrol officers surrounded the building and nobody made an entry until SWAT made the entry. That was the protocol. Well, then the country began to change and then we began having active shooter scenarios around school and things of that nature and then we found ourselves standing outside schools not responding so police got together across the country and they decided we can't do that anymore we have to make entry while the shooting is going on to stop the shooting so that was the first phase of this we're fixing to go into another phase and i'll talk about that so that's where the advanced law enforcement rapid response came we call it alert Alert training is being pushed across America, not just Rowlett, Texas, or Texas, it's in every state. And what the alert training teaches us is police officers, when we get an active shooter call, whether it's in a school, church, or wherever, schools right now, or, or churches and schools seem to be the prominent targets. When we show up now, when an officer gets there, he immediately, he or she will make entry into the school and they will start moving towards the shooting to stop the shooting. The, the, the message now is stop the shooting, stop the bleeding, stop the dying. Those are the three things we're pushing out there now. So the alert training is what we do with our officers and all of the officers in the department train together, SROs, patrol officers, me, I've been through it, we've all been through it. So that any time an active shooter scenario occurs, incident, not scenario, but an incident, then we, we all know what to do together. 
We could call Saxy over. Garlic could come over and help us. We could go somewhere else. We could be on vacation and be at an active shooter location as a police officer badge. We could go in and do the same things. We've all been trained exactly alike. The federal government is the one that's pushed that out uh, through uh, training. So we got that going on. Rowlett likes to, we're, we're doing alert training twice a year now with our SROs and our patrol division. We're trying to make that so redundant to us that there's no question what we're going to do when we walk in. Broward County is a classic example of what happens when you don't use alert. That's what happened in Broward County, is that deputy stood outside the door and never made entry. And we're not going to beat Broward County here in Rowlett. We will be going in and we will attack the, the uh, hostage or hostile gentleman. Uh, quarterly range tactical training. You know, uh, the thing about making these type of entries and stuff is that we are pumping adrenaline, pumping adrenaline. And what we start training to do, when we, we can do it in, in an actual scenario. When it is actually happening, once we train, 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 your reflexes will come and, and you'll react the way you trained. We're going to the range now constantly and doing tactical training, of course, close quarter shooting events and things of that nature so that we can, because think about it, right now, look at the audience, and an officer comes up and then a gentleman steps the back with a gun. We're going to attack that target, but look what's around. We have to be able to acquire the target and hit the target we're after. We don't have the luxury of not being on, on target because that's what we train for is to is try to get accurate. That's not to say in those high tense situations everybody's moving around, accidents will occur occasionally, but I haven't heard of any recently, but that's why we train for that. Trauma kits. <clears throat> we, we began talking, Jeff Freeman, one of our SROs, was talking to some paramedics. He's been going to a lot of these active shooter training classes, and he's teaching it for us. He was talking to the medics one time, and they, the medics said, you know, the biggest hurdle we got in an active shooter scenario is not having enough trauma kits. The paramedics who come off the ambulances have a couple of trauma kits on them in their bags they have, and then police officers will have a couple, depends on where they're at. So we've gone out and gotten some donations from businessmen around the area, and we're trying to buy hundreds and hundreds of trauma kits and keeping them close at hand so that we get into an active shooter situation, we can go into a to the, I'll, I'll use the schools, that's what we're talking about. We can go into that school, we'll have all these extra trauma kits. We can throw them to teachers. Hey, start throwing them, start applying them. Because we know that uh, if you stop the bleeding, you stop the dying. So that's our target. So we're going to go out, we're going to do a lot of training on that. We want to train civilians on how to use those trauma kits. They're very easy to use. But as long as you get a little idea of how to use them, then, then you can apply them. So we want to introduce that into our schools that these trauma kits are available and we're going to be bringing them in should we get in that situation. So there, uh, the uh, emergency medical director for the Rowlett area around here, he's pushing this so hard that he said he's be willing to train people to do that himself. That's how much he believes in it. Patrol officers are encouraged to stop in at schools. Now we're getting pro proactive. Uh, we're getting patrol officers stop in schools. GIST will probably talk about it, but they've offered lunches for the officers, free lunches if they come in. And I'm sure Kyle will talk about that in a minute. So we're going to try to increase our, our visual uh, around the schools in, the, in, in that area. <clears throat> VIPs, those are our volunteers in policing. They have agreed that they'll start going around the schools and start monitoring them a lot closer. They have a lot of jobs they're doing for us right now, but they are mobile, they are in cars, and so they'll be going around the schools also and reporting any suspicious activity. Uh, minimum of four lockdown drills per school year. That's what we're gonna try to push here in Rowlett. Lockdown drills, we believe, are one of the most important drills a school can do. Because if you practice that, you adhere to the rules of lockdown, which means you get in a classroom, you lock the door. These shooters who are going to these schools, we know we're, we're going back and looking at the history of what they're doing. If a door's locked, they're going to keep moving. 
they're going to keep moving. They like targets that they can see and hit. And if you're behind a locked door, they're not going to spend the time to sit there and try to get in that door. So we're pushing that strongly in, in the Rowlett area here, that we believe in that. And, and we want to, to make that a, something that they don't forget and they'll adhere to. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, train GISD, RSD on standard response protocol and citizen response action training. What we're doing is we're getting with our teachers. Our teachers at each school has meetings occasionally. And what we're doing is telling them what I'm telling you tonight. We need them to know what we're going to do and how we're going to respond. Because if we just come in and, and it's chaos, as you know it will be, we need them to understand what we're doing and how we want them to react to what we're doing. And so that's where we'll be talking about our protocols and things like that. I'm not going to get into that because that's things that I need to keep in another room. All right, you guys on the new board, this is y'all's part right here. You got to get out to your peers. You're the ones that know everything that's going on in your schools. You hear it, people tell you about it. Listen, talk, now this is to parents, but I'm telling you it's to you kids out there too. Talk to them, know, know who your friends are, parents know who the friends are, and know what the kids are doing online. You guys out there on this board, know, y'all see what's going on online. You see who's posting what. The old days of not reporting it are gone. They've got to be gone. And it's, if you think somebody's just kidding around, don't take it that way. Take every, every threat against you or one of your fellow students, take that as a serious threat. We as a police department will seriously investigate that threat. I promise you. We will not let a threat go uninvestigated. And if we have to go pick you up in the middle of the night at your house, we will do it. The, the, being the Mr. Dice guy involved in any kind of threats at schools is over. Those days are done. They're gone. So pay attention to social media. That's what I'm telling you. And then on parents, be a parent, not a friend. I'm not trying to give you parenting skills here, but the truth of the matter is, is that you have to be a parent when it comes to some of this stuff. You got to lock your guns up at home. How many school shootings do we know that the kids obtain the guns from their parents' closet? And, and you know, as a parent, I'm one. I would never believe that my kid would do that. I, I wouldn't. I, I, I tell you today, my kid would never do that. But I also have a gun safe at home that's got all my guns in it. So I know my kid's not going to use my guns to do anything like that. So you, you have to take care of that stuff and be conscious of it. So, I'm going to let Pat, you want to come up here from GISD, and that's my part, and we'll let them talk, and a lot of our stuff's going to start interchanging with each other, because they're doing some of the same stuff we're doing, and we're working in unison as a, as a team, and we, we share a lot of the philosophies with all three cities, because it's us, Garland, and Saxe, and we all try to mimic each other in how we do things so that we're, we're all on the same team. Pat? Thank you, Chief. While he's getting set up, my name is Pat Lamb, and I serve as the Director of Security for the Garland School District, and I have been here since December of 2014. And before that, I served in another school district as the Director of Security for 19 years. And before that, I served in the United States Air Force, started in 1977, trained as a cop. Uh, couldn't make E-5 in the enlisted ranks, so I thought it might be easier to make second lieutenant, and it was. So I went to Texas Tech, went through Air Force ROTC, and got my degree, and went in on active duty as a cop. And uh, so I think I've been involved in this for 40-some years, I think. The one point that we want to make as we get started is we are never satisfied. It's never good enough. It's always evolving because the threat is always evolving. And uh, I want you to know that we have an incredibly supportive school board. And uh, Mr. Glick has been on that board for 12 years. And if you've never heard him tell a story, you've just got to have him talk about his adventures. I could listen to him for a while, and he's uh, incredibly supportive. I will also say, also say from the onset, 
that uh, we recognize the support of our communities in the passage of the 2014 bond program and Keith is going to talk about that uh, in a little while. Let me introduce the guys. First is uh, Keith Chapman. Keith has been here for 22 years and uh, is in charge of all things security systems. So if you think about fire systems, the cameras, uh, door access, uh, motion sensors, the Raptor system, which we'll talk about, that's Keith. And Keith got his start in the United States Marine Corps. I once said he was an ex-Marine. That was a mistake. Once a Marine, always a Marine. At least that's what they say, right? Uh, and then after, after Keith passed the test, they let him go into the United States Air Force. So we, we appreciate that. So Keith is, uh, Keith is that good. So when I first came in, they didn't know me from Adam. And so I, I sat him down and said, I don't want anybody to be a yes person. Well, good, good night, man. He took that to heart. So almost everything I, I say, he says, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. But that's, that's good. That's the way we do that. So we're very glad to have Keith. Chapman. Also have Kyle Pankonine, and Kyle is our security coordinator for operations, and Kyle's been here 17 years. He grew up in Garland, and everything about emergency management, Kyle's responsible for. The chief talked about the standard response protocol. That's our protocol for emergency management, and Kyle will talk about that's, that provides a common language, a common lexicon for what we do. You might hear on the news sometimes, somebody might say they had to go into a modified lockdown or a code red or a code blue or a code TEA is in the house. Whatever that means, the standard response protocol provides a common language. Kyle is one of three national trainers for the I Love You Guys Foundation, which sponsors the standard response protocol. So. Kyle is well versed in it. We've been using it in this district since 2015. All right. I think that's the introduction. You know we face a broad threat today. You know that. Uh, it, you never know if it's going to be the person who wanders by and decides today I'm going to go into the school and I'm going to change destiny. It could be that estranged spouse. And uh, we see that, where they come to the school and they're going to take it out on their spouse and their kids. We see kids that are pushed over the edge. So I asked somebody today, when is tornado season? The answer is, yeah, on December 26th. So we've got to prepare for a multiplicity of events. And that's what we do with the standard response protocol. We want people to know what to do now get this, when seconds count. We don't want anybody to have to go to a notebook to find out what they were supposed to do if they hear locked down, locks lights out of sight. We want it to be muscle memory. And that's what we do to train. And Chief talked about the uh, training on the lockdown. Let me just say from the onset, we appreciate the support we get from each of the police departments. They're, they are involved. In our district, uh, the board in 2016, under his leadership, moved us from 32 school resource officers to 45. We have 45 SROs in our schools. I heard uh, Chief Mitch uh, Bates say the other day that we were like the top in Texas for a school district that doesn't have its own police department. That's amazing. And, I don't want people to ever forget just what a cop represents in our schools. That's our life safety. Uh, they're the folks, the men and women, who will lay it on the line. And, and when everybody else might be running away, what are they doing? They're running towards it. And you just have to appreciate that somebody like the chief and Lieutenant David Neighbors, who started the SRO, SRO program in Rowlett. When was that, 1920? <laughs> he started the program. He knows his program well, and uh, we're just, uh, we're fortunate, and I'll use the word, we're blessed to have their leadership in this district. They lead the way when it comes to drills and exercises. They don't take an excuse. 
They firmly believe that the three principles you're going to hear about positively engage all visitors, sound the alarm, and teach with the classroom door locked. Because if it's locked, then you don't have to worry about what's going on on the outside. And we know by long experience that kids cannot learn as well, teachers cannot teach as well, if they're forever looking over their shoulder in fear. So our goal is to eliminate all fear and intimidation. Can we do it? We think we can, but we'll never have arrived because we face a broad threat. So what do we have in place? A concentric circle of protection that Keith's going to talk about in a little bit involves processes, people, infrastructure, crisis communications. And then it ultimately comes down to you, me, us. And you heard the chief, if you see something, you've got to say something. We always say, if you see something that looks strange, guess what? It's strange. You've got to tell somebody. We know, I heard the chief say, the students uh, with school violence, invariably somebody knew, but nobody said anything. And I will tell you this about your police department. It doesn't matter if I call David Neighbors at 10 o'clock at night. They're going to go out to that home they're going to talk to that student and those parents and they're going to make sure that student doesn't have the ability to carry out that threat. That's amazing. You just need to know. It doesn't matter what time it is. So it falls to each of us to make a difference in the lives of our kids because what we're all about is that kid in that classroom being able to explore education without that fear. People have asked me for years, is the public schoolhouse still the safest place in the community for our kids during the day? Unequivocally, the answer is yes, but it's only because very good people sweat the details of that security behind the scenes. And Keith Chapman is going to tell you more about what that means. Keith? I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. And as Pat said, uh, I started when Rowlett High School actually opened first year, and I worked a long time with Dr. Marlene Carter, then Dr. Hammerly, eventually. And we worked to put up cameras and do things, and our security department is always talking about systems. We're always talking about how can we make it better. And in 2002, the citizens of Rowlett, Saxe, and Garland, and in 2014 again, the citizens approved a bond. Two bonds, very security centric. We did a lot of things in the last bond by adding access control, the Raptor system to screen people who are coming into our campuses. We put up cameras all over the interior of the buildings mostly. And we improved our processes. In this bond, you'll see some of the things we're touching, public address systems, telephone systems, more cameras, better cameras, better clarity, because technology changes so rapidly. We actually started talking about these upgrades before we were finished with the last upgrades, because you have to. You have to keep migrating. Technology is always getting, just like Chief Broadnax talked about, the threat's always changing. Well, technology is always changing, and we want to be on the cutting edge of what keeps our kids safe. So a lot of what we do with our infrastructure is to support what first responders when they're coming to the campus to give them information to speed up communication not only to them but to the campus so with telecommunications one of the things we do is enhance 911 so what's that mean well when somebody calls 911 it sends out the main number to the campus it also sends to our dispatch center the extension and the room number that the call came from. Now you may say, well, the person on the other end can tell you that. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe they're, they're unable to speak. Well, we can then relay that information because we have, we have access to the police radios in all three cities, the fire uh, channels, and we're able to communicate directly with those officers that are gonna respond and let them know how to get there quicker because seconds count. The other thing we do is our PA systems a small little feature we've, we've added speakers to the outside but one of the things and we had a Ken Trump he's a national speaker he's 
toured all over the United States and trained school districts and colleges all over the United States about security. And he just came in recently to do some training here in Garland. And uh, he told us we, we have a neat little feature called remote paging. And that allows us, anybody inside the building can pick up a phone and access the PA just in case there's weather outside or there's something they see and they want to get everybody in their classrooms. Well, we have the ability from any district phone, including our dispatch center, which is 24-7, to page into the school from outside of the school, which is a neat feature for during the day, we monitor weather. If we see severe weather that's about to hit, which we know in Rowlett that's happened, we can immediately announce into the school. We don't have to call the school and say, hey, can you get on the PA and make an announcement? We can immediately get in and, and make the announcement. Shelter in place. If there uh, is an active shooter or an event like that, we can put the school into lockdown remotely without having to call the school to let them know. If we get here on the police radio that there's something going on outside, we can put that school into lockout, which you'll hear from Kyle with all that means. So that little feature is a big deal. And what Ken Trump told us is, in all his travels, we're the only school district in the country, in his travels, that he's ever heard that has the ability to do that. So we try to stay on the cutting edge. The other thing we're doing, and you can see some of our technicians, but all our, our different systems that we deal with, we're increasing the number of cameras we have uh, around the outside of the building. One of the things we did in the last bond, well, we were very heavy on cameras inside the building. Well, now we want to see what's going on outside the building, too. Plus, we've added more clarity to those pictures. There, uh, obviously, technology has changed in 12, 13 years. So we're putting in megapixel cameras. You can actually zoom in and get more clarity and definition on what you're looking at. The exterior of the building helps us see when people are coming up to the building or when they're around the building at night. And it also helps us communicate to first responders after hours with our intrusion alarms. If something happens, we can follow those people because of all the cameras we have through the building if they choose to burglarize our buildings at night and tell the police officer, oh yeah, they're in this hallway, they're going to be coming out this door, just be prepared to meet them when they come out. Not to mention we can use that remote paging feature to page into the building to let the person in the building know when you go outside, just put your hands on your head, they're going to take you into custody. The other thing we're doing with our bond is we're improving our uh, vestibules, we're, or our Excuse me, we're adding vestibules. A vestibule, basically, when you walk to the front door, if you've been to some uh, uh, back elementary, Dorsey Elementary, you've seen it, you walk in, before you could just walk right down the hall. You come in, they'd buzz you in the front door, you just keep on going. Now you have to go into the office. You can't walk around. The second thing is we're adding another intercom and another locked door. Because what that does, the person, the person opens the front door, somebody may be out of sight that they can't see on the camera, and they follow them in. Now the office staff is able to look up and see that second person and stop, it, stop them at the second door and get on another intercom and ask him, can I help you also, before they let them in the building. When seconds count, we can delay somebody from getting into the building, again, to give first responders an opportunity to get to the building. Now, it happened in Webb Middle School, which is in Garland. We had a fire in 2010. One of the things that we discussed then was adding fire sprinklers to all of our buildings. Now, Rowlett, most of the schools had fire sprinklers, but we also were starting to add new uh, fire panels that have voice evac on them. So it gives instructions if the fire alarm goes off. It also adds a redundant microphone just in case power goes out that has battery backup and allows the, the, the staff to get on and let people know what's going on or when the fire department shows up, shows up to make sure if anybody's in the building, they can let them know that they're coming. So a lot of systems, a lot of things that make the schoolhouse the safest place in our communities. Now, none of that works unless you have the right people or unless you have people 
that are on board using the systems, trained and know what to do and know how to respond in an emergency. So now I'm going to bring Kyle up to talk about that. All right, well, first, thanks for having us. This is a great crowd where we're talking about it. I, it really means a lot that everybody showed up. When it comes to emergency management and training, it's important that we have the infrastructure, but the infrastructure is only as good as the person behind that infrastructure. So training is very much our most important uh, aspect as far as when we're looking at emergency management. Now, as you know, with the recent shootings in the, the country, uh, the governor released a plan of recommendations on how to increase the safety and security of a school in our state. There are things that we are working on, but a majority of that plan, we are already at or ahead of the game as far as the recommendations. Um, some of your rural counties and things, maybe not so much, but we are actually, um, we get calls sitting in our office from people throughout the state, and we'll pick up the phone and they'll say, hey, I was at uh, training with the Texas School Safety Center. They gave me your number and said uh, to contact you. What are you guys doing over there? Well, what do you really need? I don't know. They just told me to call you. So we will work with neighboring districts throughout the state, um, all over the state, and creating plans and, and try to make their schools as safe as possible. In our district, we do conduct random classroom searches of students. Um, that includes our security department and our security officers going in with a handheld metal detector. We'll randomly select classrooms, pull the kids out, use metal detectors to search them and also their belongings inside the campus or inside the classroom. At the same time, we just paid for uh, and sent out metal detectors for administration at every secondary campus that we have in the district. And the principals will, has started, back in March, started doing random uh, searches as well as our searches. Um, the drills, like Chief said, they're gonna do a minimum of four. This year, as a district standard, we have a minimum of four lockdowns district-wide. Rowlett has always gone above and beyond that. They've always had their officers in the school. They are on top of things. They, they go in and they give the, the principals advice. They're looking at the classrooms to make sure the kids are where they're at. We're just going to continue to increase that. Because what we learn is we have to build the muscle memory. And we want these things to happen just as normal. If they experience an emergency, we want it to be as simple and as normal to them as anything else they do. It's key, especially when seconds count. With that, we do, uh, we do monitor the weather for our district, um, Rowlett, Garland, and Saxe. Our Twitter page is where we post information. Uh, we have access to the National Weather Service chat line and all the fancy stuff that the meteorologists have. And no matter the time or day, we are up. A lot of times it's me. Uh, I, we're up in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock. My phone start binging and dinging. And I get up and start monitoring. And we can, we, we can see storms coming from quite a distance away. And so we're trying to get that information out to you guys so that you know, and when you see it from us and we're getting it, we're actually getting it about three minutes before you'll see it on the news because they're getting the same stuff. We're just getting it out quicker. Um, department training, we do training within our department. We do have a 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 day a year uh, department. We're constantly here, even on Christmas day, we have employees that are working, security officers and technicians. Um, and so we're constantly, if we're not in the schools, when kids are there, working with the kids and making sure the, the schools are safe, they are patrolling the schools, we're monitoring our own alarms and, and ready to respond when necessary. Staff training is key. We go to train every single staff member in this district on the standard response protocol and how to respond to any type of an emergency in Rowlett. The Rowlett Police Department do an excellent job helping us train. They go into the Rowlett schools, they train, we're speaking the same language. Um, and, and so the training is key. And what we have to understand is we, this isn't a one-time conversation in August and then not talk about it. This is something we have to bring up and keep in the forefront all the time. Every staff meeting we need to talk about something so that it's right there in the front of our brains. 
Now there is three things that we teach and we require within our district. We want everybody, and this includes you, to positively engage all visitors. All of our staff is required to wear, prominently display an ID badge. Our visitors must have a visitor's pass. Our high school students must prominently display their ID badge while they're on campus. We have to know who's there. If we see somebody without an ID, we want to engage that person and escort them back to the office. It's not good enough just to tell them how to get there. They must escort them back to the office. Number two is sound the alarm. Well, we've talked about it. If you see something, say something. If it looks suspicious to you, guess what you have to do? Say something. What we can't do anymore is chew on it for 20 minutes and then not say anything and then something happens. Our goal, all of our goal at the end of the day is to send these co kids home back to you. And so if you saw something you thought was suspicious and you were wrong, who cares? Our kids go home and that's what we're looking for. And number three, teach with the classroom doors closed and locked. This is important. There's only been one case in all of school violence where a locked classroom door was breached in an active shooter situation. So we have to go with our history and our history tells us putting kids behind a locked door saves lives when seconds count. But it's not good enough we wait till an emergency happens. These are our most valuable assets as our children and we need to keep them protected at all times for the unthinkable. We do use the standard response protocol. Um, we have four actions, lock out, that's a threat outside. Threat outside of the building, we want to keep everybody in. You as a parent, if we're in lockout, we will not allow you into the building. If you're in the building, we will not allow you to leave. There's business as normal going on inside of the building, but we just don't let anybody come in or out. So that's a lockout. We do a lockdown for a threat on the inside of the building, imminent threat of serious bodily injury or death. That's where they get out of sight of the door or window, they lock the doors, they stay there until the police officers evacuate them out of the building. Evacuate is easy, moving people from point A to point B. If they're inside and we need them out, we're going to evacuate them out. And then, of course, shelter. We shelter for weather and hazardous chemicals. Um, we also look at shelter for earthquakes and things because you'll never hear us say it won't happen here. So that's our response. And if we ever become in, get into a situation where we have to take the students somewhere else and reunify them to the parents, we use the standard reunification method. And that method is, is easy. It gives the parents a card and we go through the process to make sure positively, no doubt, that every single student is positively reunified with the correct parent. And we have done that in RALAT before. Uh, it was not this last year, but it was the year before. We implemented the standard reunification method out of Schrady, and it went well. We had a long line, but the parents were not upset because we have a process, and w we make sure that everybody's comfortable. Now, let's talk about a few things, our partners in our district. Our Raleigh Police Department, we couldn't do it without them. Great people. We have eight SROs in this city. We have two in the high schools. Technically two in the middle schools, although one of those middle schools can float, and then the two in the elementaries. So um, at any point we have an officer, an SRO, within just seconds from a, a school, and they are there, and they are there quick if we ever need them. Quickest, I mean, I think one time they called and they were there in less than eight seconds. So. It's amazing the support we get from our police department. They do the summer camps, which is very, very beneficial to our kids. I know they love it because we hear about it all the time. And our fire department, Ralph Fire Department is awesome. They respond, they don't respond with just one truck, they respond with about eight trucks, two ambulances, and four squad cars. So if we ever do have that actual situation, they're always there and we really appreciate it. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention this great, great group that you have in this city. And that's your Rallet CERT team. The December tornado, Rallet CERT was there, um, provided support, and did way above and beyond. It was amazing to see a volunteer organization do what Rallet CERT did. And so we started partnering with them allowing them to use the schools so that they could start training. You had a bigger crowd. Our relationship with CERT has grown 
big time. And, you know, I've even talked to some of the, the Garland and said, why don't y'all have CERT? Because you really need it. So Rally at CERT was a big help with the tornado, and they are a big help. And matter of fact, two years ago, they started doing a CERT camp in one of our, uh, during our summer school programs. And so their, your Rowlett CERT comes out to our summer school, teaches the kids and puts them through CERT training. And that's a great program and the kids love it. But the point is, I want you, we want you to know that in GISD security and Garland Independent School District as a whole, we will never give up. It's never good enough. We stay up at night thinking about what we need to think about as far as keeping the kids safe so that you guys can sleep at home. And it's never good enough because our goal is to make sure that every kid that starts kindergarten in Rowlett graduates whenever their time comes. And we're going to do everything in our district to make sure that happens. Thank you, Kyle. So we're going to wrap up. I think we had 15 minutes. What have we done? 16? No. So it takes a community, doesn't it? It takes you uh, paying attention to what's going on around you. Parents, talk to your kids about looking up and not down, paying attention, walking with somebody else. Uh, if they're ever approached to, to run away, let people know that they're approached. It's a community. My last name is Lamb. I like Christopher Reeve. Do you remember Christopher Reeve? Superman. I found out his mother's maiden name. Are you ready for this? Lamb. I'm just saying. He, he addressed the nation years ago. And he said, America is stronger when all of us take care of all of us. And man, did he get it right when it comes to security in Garland ISD in Rowlett, Texas. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Pat, Keith, and Kyle, and uh, Garland Independent School District. And I'm sure you'll have questions for them, and we'll bring them back up at the end. We're very happy to say we also have Rockwell Independent School District here. So, um, gentlemen, if you'll come forward, I have Tom Maglisco. Very good. And uh, is, is this Patrick? OK, Patrick Just. So I'll let them um, tell you what they're doing. And we're very glad you're here with us, gentlemen. Thank you for coming, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, real quick, I know we only have a sliver of Garland, so just asking, are, do we have Rockwall ISD parents here tonight? A few hands, well that's good. Uh, you said Garland. Did I? Yeah, Garland. Excuse me, pardon me, but to helping out with, <laughs> I'm following the Garland ISD folks here. Um, to those of you who are here from Rockwall, we'd be happy to stick around and, and maybe answer some more specific questions about Rockwall as well too, but I want to respect the room. Um, we'll share a little bit about Rockwell ISD, but I think a perfect starting point for us is probably the ending point for the Garland ISD folks. Um, I just love the fact that he's referencing that it is about the community, and I love the picture that they had of the graduates because that's why we do what we do. Uh, those of us in the school business, that picture right there, that's what we do. And um, it's tough that in schools we also have to think so much about safety and security to the degree that we're having to right now. And so it's interesting when we're, when we're operating in a, at an abnormal time, it's tough that we have to do some abnormal things other than opening up the school door and teaching the kids. So um, looking at that, and again with respect to the room, in Rockwell ISD, I think it's great that we're here together tonight because one of our themes in Rockwell ISD this year is that we are in fact better together. And um, as a community, we are a school community. We do a lot of things with Garland. In fact, uh, it was some of our police in Rockwall who came to the standard protocol um, training that you offered in Garland who came to us and said, we need to do this. And then we did that in Rockwall ISD. We just uh, hosted for several other districts. We didn't need to have Garland there, although we do appreciate Chief being there that day and, and some of his officers um, from Rowlett being there. Um, this is about our community and so in Rockwell ISD we have uh, kind of a four-pronged approach that we're taking to things because school safety is just as we've been talking about it is everyone's job and so every single stakeholder that we have in the room here tonight this is about us because when we have safe 
and civil communities, then we're going to have safe and civil schools. And so our four-pronged approach to looking at things this year, um, starting, of course, just with the simple safety measures, which we'll talk about and which we've been discussing already, but then also taking a look at what we can do to our school climate and where we can impact different things in our school climate, which also means impacting our community climate, which is why we're thrilled to be here tonight, because Garland and Rockwall being in Rowlett, being right next to one another, we're, we're all taking care of one another. And so um, looking also then at what we can do to take care of the psychological support for our students, but also our families. As uh, uh, one thing that's been hitting in our community is that we've had some parents that have been dealing with struggles and unfortunately taking their lives, and that means that we have to serve everybody and take, help to make our entire community feel safer. And then finally, also looking at what we can do to just be more civil with one another. Again, at an abnormal time, it seems that we act abnormally a little bit. And it seems as though being uncivil with one another is becoming the norm. And so we have to ask ourselves, what can we do to try to change that and be more civil with one another? So as part of our comprehensive approach, the four-pronged approach in Rock YSD, it is largely the community. We can't come to enough meetings like this to try to get everybody on board, just as our friends from Garland, from, from the Rowlett Police Department are trying to do the same thing to the students that are here, uh, it's awesome that you guys have that going on because that's what we're trying to do in Rockwall as well too, is to champion the kids because we've found out through programs like um, Rachel's Challenge that when we challenge the kids to rise above and the kids start leading the town, the adults start looking at themselves a little more carefully and saying, yeah, these kids have something going on here. Why can't we follow that? And you saw that come out of Parkland. Well, why do it in a reaction to something horrific happening in Parkland, Florida, as opposed to doing it proactively ahead of time? And so what we're trying to challenge our kids to do as we go forward is to recognize that a more civil community is, in fact, a safer community and also a more productive community. But then also, um, this is for everybody. It's not just about kids. Again, this is the community. And then also in our community, looking at the fact that also, thank you, that every person has a unique gift. And it's the combined talents of these unique gifts that really make something special in our community. And we're trying to help every single kid and every single adult in our community recognize that they have a gift. And as Picasso said, the meaning of life is to find your gift, but the purpose of life is to give your gift away. And so when you are being for others and serving for others, it can make a very powerful impact on a community. And so the last bullet, we'll back to that one, the last bullet right there, we marginalize a lot. We push people to the edges, and we're trying to help our kids to understand what it means to push people to the edges and for someone to feel as though they've been marginalized and what we can do to help them to recognize that, and when they see it, to do something about it. And we do a lot of that in our country, we do a lot of that in our community. What can we do to improve upon that? And then looking at the school business, specific just to kids, is trying to take a look at what we can do to recognize that every single one of our kids deserves to be embraced as though they, he or she was one of our own. There was a time, I'm pretty old, when I was growing up when it was about our kids. And through time, it started to become about my kid. And when we forget that those kids in that Garland ISD graduation picture, there are kids too in Rockwell ISD. And the kids at the Rowlett Community Center, there are kids too. And what we need to do to help make sure that it, we all understand it is about us, it's about all of us. And then finally, that our kids embody the hope and the power to change everything that we think is wrong in our world today. And when we can challenge our kids to get behind these belief statements, which if you put them all up all at one time, oops, sorry, was next last slide. But when we take all those belief statements and we say they're not belief statements, it's a mindset. And in Rock YSD, that becomes a mindset. In our community, it becomes a mindset. Where does that take us and where does it take us uh, as a whole entire community and then ultimately as a country? But we do have some security measures. And again, if you're from Rockwell ISD, we'd be happy, Patrick and I, to sit back afterwards and, and uh, maybe address specific things to you all or if they're general things, we can talk about it. But a lot of the same things that Garland ISD is doing. I think we get together as school districts and uh, we're doing a lot of the same things because they make sense and they're the best things that we can do for kids. We've got the, uh, the just like you all, um, we've got the 
dual entry where we have the vestibules that you have to be buzzed through and you have to come through an office, um, limiting the points of entry to our buildings, um, some of the other uh, enhancements to our camera system and all, on all of our buses we have camera systems. Every kid on a bus knows there's four cameras, including one outside of the bus that uh, we can get a hold of and we can actually monitor and zoom in just as Garland's talking about what you all have. Um, taking a look at a lot of our uh, other safety features, we've got shatter resistant, bullet resistant. There's no such thing as bullet proof glass necessarily, but uh, bullet resistant glass that's on the front of our buildings and certain windows, and I don't want to specify where those are, they're on our buildings. Um, and uh, as Garland was talking about, whatever we can do to limit the entry to someone who wants to get in that we don't want to get in, that buys our police that much more time to uh, come together. Uh, we have brought in more additional SROs trying to get the uh, two on as many campuses as we can and definitely at the high school level. On another slide coming up, we also have security guards now at our high schools in addition to that, improving the number of security guards. Um, but then we also have safe and civil schools training, again, that we're trying to uh, help all of our teachers to understand things because on the next slide, if you could, we hosted a trauma and resiliency conference in our district this year and brought in a national uh, group to come in because it's not just about our kids. It's about our community, but recognizing that in these abnormal times, we have a lot of people, kids and adults, which means our staff members as well, too, who are dealing with trauma. And uh, if we have forgotten about taking care of one of our, one of, of taking care of ourselves and taking care of one another, then we've forgotten one big, huge piece about how we make our community feel safer and how we are more civil with one another. So we're trying uh, to be better about that. Uh, also taking a look at uh, developing core teams that we developed last year so that we can start it up. Core stands for creating opportunities for resiliency and empathy. And we're challenging a core club on every campus led by kids to challenge their peers to create opportunities for resiliency and empathy throughout the year. And then we have a core team on every campus that's responsible for safety, security, and civility. And once a month, We'll meet with them as a district core team, improving all of our safety measures throughout our district, but improving all of our civility measures throughout our district. And then those core teams of adults are responsible for going back to those campuses and championing those core clubs of kids. Um, the other last thing, uh, you mentioned the I love you guys training, fantastic stuff. And again, I, I really think a lot of this came from what you guys are doing with them. And we wouldn't have had them come to Rockwall if not for you all. And then finally, um, one more, one last slide. In addition to those monthly core meetings, uh, we are also um, looking to bring in mental, her mental first aid training, which is a lot like the trauma and resiliency. Again, the more we can help our staff members and the adults in our community to recognize trauma in others when we see it, and how people respond to trauma. If you're not aware of this, we talk a lot about mental health, and a lot of times now professionals are calling it behavioral health. That it's not as though you are dealing with mental health problems, you're exhibiting behavioral health problems. And what we can do to spot those behavioral problems and recognize that the behavior is telling us something about you. And putting together strong teams within our district that are monitoring all of our kids. I think I might have missed a bullet point there too, but we have online safety that we're monitoring. And I know Garland's doing things like this as well too. And, and I apologize if I missed it in, in their presentation, but we're always looking at what our kids are doing online while they're in our school utilizing our resources. One of the things that's tough though is we use the Google Suite and Google Suite doesn't necessarily let you in to observe some of those things. In Rockwall, we brought in a program that's going to allow us to do that so that we'll always be able to see what kids are, 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 are necess not necessarily watching everything they're doing but watching for keywords that they might put in that would alert us to the fact that we've got to get in there and try and find that kid and see if they need some help in some way. Leaving you with one last slide um, as we wrap up. Again, in Rock YSD, we're taking the stance that we are, in fact, better together. We're committed to coming out to wherever we can come out. If you're a Rockwell folk and you've got some place you need us to come speak and talk to them about this mindset, this better together mindset, and the beliefs that are up there behind uh, me right now. Um, that's a big part of our approach to safety and security because it's not just about the safety and it's not just about the enhancements. It's about what we can do to reach out to everyone in our community to help them with mental health and to help them feel safe so that they can be civil. Thank you for your time. We appreciate you uh, having us here. And
Pat, Patrick was emphatic he wanted me to stay up here, but I want to just acknowledge I cannot do anything that I'm doing in our, my department in our district would say without Patrick Justin in our district, he does great things for us. Um, he is the fireman. We need some help. He, he comes running with anything. So thanks to Patrick and appreciate you getting the slides for me. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I feel better. Do y'all feel better? I think, Tom, you, uh, are you a motivational speaker? <laughs> so you, you need to be if you're not. My new hashtag is going to be community civility. I like that. You Everybody like that? I want to see it out there on the Rowlett Facebook pages. Hashtag community civility. Let's start it. It's a really good term. Thank you very, very much. I just had to say that. I'll let you introduce no Lieutenant problem. Neighbors. You're the mayor. You get to do that. This is Lieutenant Neighbors. He's going to um, have a really important session on community active shooter response. Yes, while well, he's getting that ready. We've been talking a lot about school safety tonight, so let's talk about your safety tonight. We know America's changing. We know that now you can get shot going to concerts in Las Vegas. We know you can get shot going to the malls shopping. We know you can get shot while you're attending church services. We know you can get shot while you're in your business working at your desk. America has changed. The culture is different. And so active shooter training not only applies to us going to schools, but now we have to train you, the citizen, and make you alert on what you need to do when you're in a situation. Lieutenant Neighbors is gone, got the certifications in this. He's doing this training across Rowlett. We'll do it for you. I'll let him get into that, but we need to now change your minds. Now it's your turn. We need, we need your input now. Need you to change how you think about what you do and where you do it. Good evening, thank you for coming out. I don't know how I can follow this guy speaking because I'm not a motiv motivational speaker. I just speak the truth. Um, Last month, or early May, three of us went down to uh, Houston for train the trainer for uh, civilian response to active shooters. We've been doing a great job in the United States, for the most part, form formulating a national response for cops to go into active shooter situations. We've been training that for 20 years. It's free training for us. The Department of Homeland Security started it and Texas was in the forefront of developing the active shooter training. Cops from the line level officers up to command staff, SWAT officers got together 20 years ago and started formulating a plan on how are we going to react to this? What are we going to do? How are we going to train the cops that we're all on the same page no matter what jurisdiction we're in? Like the chief says, I can be in another state. Like I was in Baltimore a couple of years ago right before the Freddie Gray riots. And, you know, the, the, those guys at Baltimore PD has been through it. And they said, hey, I was in an executive management class. They said, hey, if, if we need help, you guys willing to help? And, you know, the 45 of us in the class raised our hand and we were ready to go. And we were, we've all been trained the same. This is free training too. We will never charge you for it. If somebody calls you up and says, hey, I want to train you in this and charge you, you we can't do that. The purpose of this is to get it out to the community, get all of y'all trained, because we've been training cops for 20 years how to go in a building. We're not training y'all how to save your own lives before we get there and what to do when we get there. So this is a brief overview. Uh, we'll offer the class to the community, churches, businesses, uh, civic groups. Uh, we'll come out and, and go through this training through you. I have cut out a whole bunch of this. It's usually about an hour and a half long got several videos that, do, that illustrate some of the things that people do when they're under stress. I'm just going to show a few of those. So an active attack event, that could be with a firearm. We've seen them in Europe and one in New York with a vehicle. You're seeing machete attacks uh, over in Europe. We haven't really seen any here. But the definition of this is an active attack event equals somebody trying to attempt mass murder. Now whether it's successful or not, it just depends on the people that are there that respond to it, how quick they respond to it, and how many officers you can get there to deal with the threat. And our number one responsibility when we have one of these incidents is we go to the, incident, we go to the person causing the incident, the attacker, the aggressor, and we neutralize the aggressor, whatever that takes. We don't stop, 
to help people, we'll, we'll step right over you because we've got to get there and stop the, the killing and the assault. <clears throat> now, what does one look like? You know, you're all familiar with FBI profilers. Well, there's really no hard and fast profile. Uh, Secret Service has a threat assessment center, and they've done a good job, uh, in, uh, as well as the FBI, of, of taking these incidents apart. And if the person's not, uh, if the person died in the assault, the aggressor, they do a forensic uh, dissection of their psychological well-being, talking to family, friends, going through their computers, reading stuff, reading their, their, their writings. But really, there is a broad range of individuals. We've had them as young as 12, all the way up into their 70s. Now, these, I'm not just specifically talking about school assaults. I'm talking about movie theaters, churches, synagogues, malls, any place that people gather. They have an anger mindset. They've got an ax to grind with somebody. Or they've been radicalized over the internet, be it through uh, Muslim influences, you know, hate groups, anybody, but they're angry. They're an angry person. And a lot of times they, they call it leakage or broadcast. They get on social media and talk about it. Or they talk to somebody at their work about it. They'll make comments. And how many times have you seen on the news somebody gets up there and says, well, I knew he's mad about something, but I didn't think he would do this. Well, they didn't see something and say something. You know, l l leave it up to us to do the threat assessment and to go talk to that person. Because we can mitigate a lot of this or reduce it if we go out there, we talk to the person, and do th a threat assessment. I'm working with a uh, Secret Service agent that I know. He's uh, head of President Bush's detail. He's agreed to come out here and, and teach threat assessment to our officers. We're going to include GISD and RISD because th they get threat, threat assessment from a different viewpoint than we do. So we're looking at it from the criminal behavior. They're looking at more psychological um, and bullying points you know, when, when they're dealing with school. So, so and some more of the uh, risk factors is they got a history of violence, whether it's violence directed at them or violence that they're directed to others. Playing video games, being immersed in uh, virtual reality video games, shooting stuff. Uh, we found that a lot of the younger shooters have, they're isolated, they don't have a lot of friends, they got an ax to grind with somebody, but they're also heavy into these watching violent videos or playing violent video games. Sometimes there's substance abuse or dependence. In an, a, a fair percentage of these, probably about one third of it, you're going to have some form of mental illness. It's either diagnosed or undiagnosed. But people around in that family or those close circle of friends, if they have any, are going to know that, but they just don't say anything about it. And we need people to approach us and to give us that information so that we can get those people help. And so we can intervene prior to any violence happening. Sometimes they have a history of thinking about suicide or suicide attempts. And if they're thinking about suicide, they want to go out, you know, kill a bunch of people and then commit suicide. Stalking, harassing, or threatening. Um, We've had several of them, especially when they go into businesses or churches. The last church shooting we had in Texas, the guy was there looking for his mother-in-law, and he ended up killing 30 or 40 people in that church. There's usually negative family dynamics, or they have no support system. They're just isolated. They feel isolated. They're angry at the world. They just want to get back at someone. Sometimes it's somebody in particular. Sometimes it's just a group of people. Now, this was kind of shocking when I was going through the classes, is this next slide. Most of y'all think that all the shootings occur at schools. It's about 24, 25 percent. Most of them occurred in businesses, churches, and municipal governments, or government gatherings. So 52 percent of those assaults didn't occur. They occurred in a situation like this, or a council meeting, or some type of political rally. Outdoors, concert we had, or the concert they were having in Las Vegas where the guy injured over 500 people. Um, some other concert venues and then others just miscellaneous uh, assaults that weren't really classified under any of these. It was kind of a combination of, of one or two of those. 
And then there's 55% of the attacks, there was correlation between the attacker and the location and the people where they were at the location. Say they were mad, at, they got fired. They went to the business, they targeted them. But about 45% of them had no connection. Like they go to a mall, they go to the movie, they go to it, they, they just start randomly shooting uh, groups of people. I can't get really specific into the facts of the case, but RPD stopped a young man that was parked in this parking lot watching a soccer game on a night there was a basketball game with a loaded assault rifle and patrol officers stopped him because he looked suspicious, interviewed him, he was nervous, we ended up arresting him for a warrant, got into his car, found the rifle, got into his phone and his computer later on and found out that he'd been watching Columbine, he was fascinated with that. We intervened and therefore we didn't have an assault. So we try to be aggressive, you know, we're, we're around when there's sporting events going on at the schools, we have SROs that work those, and we just try to get out there and try to mitigate as much as we can or prevent it. Now, the number of deaths directly correlates to how quickly the police get there and the target availability. And kind of what we want to do as we go through this is teach you not to be a target or to mitigate your situation if somebody comes in this room. So how many exits are in here? Y'all look at them and you see six exits, There's three on each side. There's actually 24 exits. Each one of those windows is an exit. If for some reason they're blocked and you can't get out, you break that window and you go out the window. If Virginia Tech, when they were assaulted, there was a classroom on the second floor, the professor blocked the door, he told the kids break the window out and go out the second floor. They all got out the out of the second floor, he was killed by shots through the door because he was holding the door. So think in terms of not just doors, but what other ways can I get out of this room? And I know that y'all don't think that way, and from being in this job so long, I, I can't think any other way. So you just have to change what your mindset is. This is deceiving. You, you start looking at the shootings from 2000 all the way to 2015 when this study was done and most of the police are getting there within three minutes but that is not hard and fast it depends on what kind of calls are on previous to this one coming out what the traffic is what time of day it is so you guys need to even though you see this three per three minutes you need to be thinking in terms of what am I going to do in those three minutes before the police get there how am I going to get myself out of where this, is, this uh, assault is going on. How am I going to get out of here and provide myself with time? Because distance is time. The more distance you can create between you and the attacker, the more time you have. And that's what we say when we're out there on the street dealing with people. If we're being assaulted, distance is time. If I can get away from that guy, back up, and give me time to react, then I've got more time. We're going to briefly go over the science of disaster response. Uh, there's three, three, three stages of this. Denial, something happens and you can't believe it's happening. The least amount of time you spend in that frame of mind, the better off you are. Then you have to deliberate. You're under stress. Somebody's coming in here assaulting or shooting. What am I going to do? Well, you don't have a lot of time to figure that out or you're going to be one of the victims. So then, once, you, once you've deliberated and decided what you're going to do, then you've got to do it. And you've got to do it quick. And this has to go in seconds, or one or two seconds. So there's the human brain. They use lizard brain, primitive brain. They don't have higher thinking like we do. So we, our brain, we, th we think fight, flight, or freeze. What does lizard brain do? They're reflexive. I know not, not a lot of y'all catch lizards, but I did when I was a kid. You sneak up on one, you get ready to touch it, and as you move, they take off. They don't sit there and think about, you know, is this a danger? What do I do? They immediately, reflexively, take off. They react. They're fixed. They know what they're going to do. They're, they don't get emotional about it, and they're fast. This is stress response. I'm not going to go into this a whole lot. But you sitting here, 
a lot of y'all are between 60 and 90 heartbeats beats a minute. You're relaxed. But as you become under stress, your heartbeat goes up. After 150 beats per minute, your fine motor skills start to deteriorate. At 175, you don't have any fine motor skills unless you train. We train, we train, and we train, and we train. We practice uh, tactical breathing to slow our heart rate. You practice tactical breathing, you can lower your heart rate about 40 beats per minute. You know, I've heard Biden talk about SEAL Team 6 when they went in there to get bin Laden. Some of those guys' heart rates were in the 50s while they were assaulting that compound because they practice, practice, and practice, and they control the stress, they can control their breathing. This video right here was an attack in a Jewish deli in France. One gunman comes in there with an AK-47, starts shooting at the front of the store. Look what people are doing. How many times has she taken her baby out of that carriage? Hundreds of times. Can she do it while she's under stress? No, her heart rate's probably 170 or better an hour, a minute. She can't do it. You've got some people that run around the store. They're running in circles. One lady that I'm going to show you here in another clip of this, she lays down on the floor and plays dead. That's the worst thing you can do. In the full presentation, we'll have an interview on there from one of the girls that, that survived the Virginia Tech shooting. She played dead and was shot three times. And if the police hadn't gotten there so quick, got the situation settled, and then started working on her, she'd be dead. So you've got to calm yourself, breathe, and then you've got to shift your emotion from disbelief or fear into anger. Turn anger into action and get out of there. But you've got to stay fit. Now, that doesn't mean you have to run, you know, five miles, but you've got to, be, got to have the ability to get out of there. And also, if somebody comes into this room, you don't have time to get your purse. You don't have time to get your belongings. Make sure you got your phone. Keep your phone in your pocket, you know, when you're in a public area. But leave your stuff, get out. You can get replaced. That can be replaced. I've got some video that I'll show in the full class of a council meeting where a gentleman comes in and pulls a gun out, and he pretty much announces what he's going to do. And you've got people stopping to get their purses, stopping to get their stuff. Some people just froze there. And the guy's firing off rounds in the, in the meeting. And finally, he gets confronted by an officer that, come, that was off-duty that comes in there. So react. We script a lot. Just like athletes do, they think, OK, I, uh, I'm going to jump this hurdle. So they think about it in their mind. We think we script as we go to calls. You know, we're getting a certain call, family violence call. OK, I'm going to park here. I'm going to approach this way. You know, we just sit and go through our mind what we're going to do. And you need to do that when, you're, when you come to a public place or you're in, in church, you know. This is bad to, to say, but when I sit in church, I sit by a certain place so that I can watch the, the congregation in case somebody comes in the back. There are several of us that sit at different places. I've told my wife where to go, how to describe me from head to toe because the cops aren't gonna know who I am when, I, when they show up and they're under stress. So we script out things and it just becomes second nature. I know a lot of you don't wanna think about this. You don't wanna think it's gonna happen here. I hope it never happens here, but I hope if it ever does that you're, you've done some preparation so that you're not like the lady that just fell on the floor and played dead. And you've got to practice that. Practice it in your head, script it in your head, but, but think about what you would do. Think about if somebody came in the back door, where, where you would go from here. If somebody came in all three of these doors, what would you do? Just get in that uh, frame of mind. that first one you should have got up and started moving. You don't wait, you don't think it's firecrackers. Assume anything you hear is a gunshot and get out of there. If you sit around and you worry about it or you deny that's not what it is, it's firecrackers. Um, years ago at Wedgwood Baptist Church over in, in uh, Fort Worth, they were having a youth program on a Wednesday night. Guy comes in there and starts shooting. They thought it was part of the program. They killed a dozen kids. And there was a police officer in there that didn't have his gun. It's in the car. So he had to go out of there, get in his car, and come back. So if you hear something like that, be familiar with it and get out of there. Don't, don't worry about looking silly if, it, if that's not what it was. Hiding and hoping and playing dead are not good tactical 
moves. We don't know if the, if the person's going to come in the room and walk around the desk, say if you're in the library, or you know, most of the stuff that, you, that you're going to hide underneath is not going to be, not going to stop any bullets, especially uh, from a high-powered rifle. So hiding and hoping is, is, not, uh, is not a good strategy. Avoid, that's putting, that's creating time. You're creating distance, which creates time. Then you deny, if we can barricade the doors, we barricade the doors, just to slow them down. And then if we're in the kill zone, which we're too close, you know, there was a recent uh, shooting, and I don't remember if, where, exactly where it was, but there was a young man that was there. <clears throat> there was a shooting. The guy started reloading his assault rifle. The guy saw that he was reloading, and he attacked him. He took the rifle away from him. He got severe burns on his arms from the barrel because the guy just shot 30, 60 rounds through it, but he's able to defend the guy and stop the killing. So if, if you're where you can put hands on them and you're too close to get away and you see an opportunity, take it. This is the same gunman coming in the front of the deli. The guy just ran out the door and took off running. There's going to be a couple more coming out. He's yelling at people on the street and they take off. He's the one, he recognized the danger immediately and got out of there. Some of the other people didn't have that opportunity. You also have to consider secondary exits in the building. So we have this lady down here. Man, it's not gonna work. She's hiding down here by that ladder. So what are your, some of your secondary exit, exits? You've got that push bar on the door that goes out to the alley. You could go up that ladder and hide in the attic. This door, she didn't secure. She could have, there's an exit right there by the door. There's the ladder. We want to deny. Lock the door, lights out, out of sight. Was the mantra that we have on our lockdowns at school. You know, barricade, the heavier the barricade, the better. The more, the better. Door stops are great to have by your doors. There are commercial locks that you can use for these type of doors that open to the outside. This right here is a large poly cart full of potatoes. There's some other barricades there. She could have pushed that up against the door and he couldn't have gotten through there. She could have stacked those, that shelving against the door to deny him access to her, which is buying her time to get out that back door. But if you're under stress and your heart rate's hitting that 150, 175 beats a minute, you are not thinking clearly and all you have is gross motor skills. Here's some of the commercial locks available that you can put on the doors. Um, there's a bracket up there where you can pick those up. There's also locks that'll flip to keep the doors from opening. Now, after you deny them and you're hiding, they come through that door. If you're in a position, say you're on either side of the door like this is a training exercise, he comes in that door, they're going to try to disarm him. They're going to go for that gun, try to lock up that gun and lock up the hands, his hands, and do a takeaway or at least jam that gun so it doesn't fire to give other people opportunity to get out of there. What you want to do is shift his, his mind from actively shooting. Now look at the, this guy's decided he's going to, he's doing something. He's got that wine bottle. He's at least making an effort. Look at these people running back and forth. She just decides to play dead. There's a couple other people in this store that I have on another video that ended up getting killed because they played dead. You avoid, you deny, and you defend. But you've got to know your surroundings. And what you do matters. What you don't do matters. As the attack starts, is there any primary exits? If so, get out. If you you avoid. If no, then you deny. You start barricading up, shutting and locking doors if you can. And then while you're, while you're denying him access to that, also look around for other exits. Because you don't want to just barricade up somewhere unless you, that's, there's no other way out. You want to slow that person down, get out of there, and, and remove yourself from that situation. 
And there's a false assumption that a lot of these people commit suicide before the police get there. That's probably about 18 to 23 percent that kill themselves before the police get there. I'm sorry. It's about 18 to 23 percent of the individuals commit suicide before the police get there. It's not a large number as everybody uh, would think, and that's what we that's what I thought prior to going to this training. And if you can't get out, then you're just going to have to defend. When the police arrive, you need to follow our commands. We're going to be amped up. We might not use the greatest language. We'll try to, but it's a stressful situation. We're going in there to probably take gunfire and to lay down gunfire. So follow our commands. Keep your hands where you can see them. And then if we tell you not to move, don't move. Because we're going to take you out in the parking lot. We're going to assess who you are, search you probably to make sure that you're safe, and then we're going to move you further away from the situation. And then we'll start talking with you, getting all your information and, and finding out, getting intel from you as to what happened. <clears throat> Our focus is to go in there and stop the killing, stop the dying, and then we evacuate the injured. We're starting to work with the fire department to train those guys to come into the hot zone with us. Traditionally, we went and secured the building, secured the suspect, then the fire department came in. So we're going to be doing a layered approach or a modified approach to that, getting them the protective gear they need, and then we're going to be pushing the aggressor away, pushing them back, pushing them back, pushing them back, making contact. And as we do that, the firemen will come in behind us to start triaging and treating uh, the wounded. Because if you can get, if you can get into the hospital in that golden hour, you're going to save lives. We've learned that in Afghanistan and Iraq. And some of the techniques we've learned over there for saving the soldiers uh, in the war zone is very applicable over here, even though we don't do it as much. But those techniques save lives. We can get them treated and get them out of here and get them to the hospital. Sorry for the sound on this. It's a little weak. There's been an active shooter in an office building, and he's, he's making contact with them, and he's going to get them out of the building. He's telling them to raise their hands, do what he tells them to do, don't reach in your pockets, don't reach around your belt, don't reach in your purses, come with me, and we're going to get you out of here. Thank you. Try to relax, everyone. Try to relax. I'll take a bullet before you do. That's for damn sure. Just be cool, okay? There's no doubt this guy take a bullet for him. We're, we're trying to do away with the EMS delay. When people need help, we get them. But we're going to probably do some training if we can get the doctor to agree to it or we can get another instructor out here that when we do this training and we do the full training, we can either offer it at the end of this or as another separate class to give you all some emergency medical training so that if you're around somebody, it doesn't mean if it's a gunshot wound, it could be somebody got hurt in a in a chainsaw accident, you know, at home on the farm or whatever, you guys know what to do, know how to provide first aid to somebody that's, that's uh, critically injured. And we want to offer that um, through us and the fire department. And we're, we're in the process of talking with them about putting some curriculum together. We will never, ever name any of these suspects in our presentation. Never. They don't deserve to be named. We don't talk about them. We'll talk about the cases. We'll highlight the victims. We'll, we'll let you see victim stories and how they're affected and how they're still affected years later. But we will never do them uh, the justice or say their name in public. We talked about active shooter events, the, the disaster response, avoid, deny, and defend. If you don't take anything away from that, take away these two things. Avoid, deny, defend, see something, and say something. Because I don't want you to be the one that realizes that afternoon, man, I knew he was going to say something, but I didn't think he'd actually do it. And like Pat says, we'll get a phone call. We'll get notified of social media, hey, this kid's making this threat. It doesn't matter. We run that from the time we get that phone call until we put it to bed, whether that's putting that child or 17-year-old, 18-year-old in jail for the terroristic threat, or we're satisfied that that was a kid that 
just got stupid behind the keyboard. And we will always run those down. I know our partners, Garland PD, Saxon PD, do the same thing. So you can rest assured that if there's threats made on social media, we're going to vet those and we're going to make sure that, you know, we put those to bed and we resolve those threats before we go home. Here's my contact information. We'll be happy, there's, th there's three of us that are trained in this, we'll be happy to come out to your community group, your church. Uh, for those of you that have churches here that are worried about security, we'll be happy to come out and do a security survey of your church, your business, tell you what, what looks good in your, at your site or what you can improve on. Uh, some stuff's a little, you know, cost money to, to harden up your business or your church. But uh, we'll be more than happy to do that. We've, We've done one last month uh, at Sacred Heart, and so those folks up there are going to be doing some training with them, both in English and Spanish. Uh, and then we've given them some suggestions on what to do about communication on the campus with radios, um, and then how to respond to different things. So we're going to be reaching out to them and, and other churches and providing this training, and then be a resource if you've got questions. You can call me anytime and ask me something. You know, if I'm in a meeting, I'll get back to you when I get, the, when I get back to the office or all my voicemail goes to my phone. So um, I'll be available in the back if you have, if y'all have any questions. Uh, this is about an hour and a half training when we do it uh, with, with all the components to it, and we'd be more than happy to uh, come out and train you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Neighbors, and thank you to everyone that presented tonight. We'll move into our question and answer segment. Um, I'll see, I'll take a couple from the audience and then we'll see who's on um, Facebook Live that would like to ask a question. If you have a question, if you would raise your hand. Do we have another microphone or should I just repeat the question? Well, if you're close, here. Don't blow out the speaker like I did the first time. I'll try not to. What's an SRO? What is an SRO? So an SRO is a security resource officer. So school resource officer, I'm sorry. I guess I shouldn't answer questions. I should turn that over. So uh, school resource officers are uh, official police uh, men and women that are in our schools and their specific uh, duty is to protect our schools and our children. Do you want to add to that? Okay. How many schools and how many children are the RISD people, I mean GISD, excuse me, GISD people responsible? How many schools and how many children are the GISD res uh, people responsible for? Help me with a... We have, we have 72 campuses, 85 facilities, and 57,000. 75 campus, 80... 57,000 kids. 14 administrative offices. Does that answer your question? That's a lot of people to keep safe. Questions? Can you go back there, Martha? This question's for the, um, any of the district representatives, I suppose. Um, I understand that knowledge is power when it comes to preventing these types of attacks, but how are you balancing um, privacy rights with the research and um, camera systems and everything that you guys use to try and determine uh, the best way to deter these types of attacks? Can I, can I get all the presenters to come up front so we can like manage the microphones? Um, Martha will manage the microphones with questions and I can hand you all over the microphones for answers. Did you all understand Mr. Winget's question? Who wants to take that one? So, so with the, uh, you mentioned cameras specifically. I don't know if you're familiar with the FERPA laws. It basically protects our students and student records. We have a very robust system in place from a video perspective to um, <clears throat> ensure those records are protected. Uh, a special ed education rooms where we get requests for cameras, we protect that video. Only certain people have access to that video. And we make sure if a video is archived and we 
give it to the, to the police for any reason. They sign for it, they get a warrant, and we go through a process to make sure each student's uh, student records are, are handled correctly. Is there anything else, Pat? Did that answer your question? Okay. Uh, Denise, do you have any questions on Facebook you'd like to get so these? We had one, she didn't specify which district. Uh, she just wants a clarification on the new clear backpack policy. Clear plastic or clear plastic with mesh allowed? So I'd like that answer expanded. Could you talk to us about um, if there are any, are any backpack policies in any of the schools, in which schools, and why and why not? I think you can take that one. Relative to the backpacks, we leave that up to parents. We're not requiring a clear bag or a mesh bag. Uh, at all. We're just not. And if parents want to do that, that's fine. But other than that, if we require it, um, we reached out to the students. We went out and talked to the student groups. Student groups didn't want it. We reached out to the police department. Police department just didn't think it was um, an effective strategy. It gives a false sense of security. And so that's our perspective. If you want to use a clear bag or a mesh bag, please do, but that's not going to be a requirement. So I thought COIL was requiring it this year. Is that a, a false statement? Well, it's, there's a few of them that it's not, but it's a different requirement. I can't hear you, Kevin. Sure, it gets worse. There are a few um, of the middle schools that have sent out letters saying it's required this coming school year. So that's going to be reversed. And uh, we made a decision that as a district, here, here's the thing, if one school does it because it's safe, oh, we do it for safety, then every school has to do it. And it's our desire not to go there because of the uh, reasons I stated. It's an ongoing discussion. This year, though, it's not going to be required. Anything RISD you want to add? Or you have, do you have any backpack policy? No. 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 Okay. Hands? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up a question. Um, so why are we not doing metal detectors and SROs at every entrance to the schools? And when or why not? RISD, you want to do it first? I, I don't want to speak necessarily for Rockwell ISD or definitely for Garland, but um, we've, we've all across the state and all across the country looked into a lot of those different options. And I have people who call us and ask us, about backpacks and about metal detectors and things like that. We've met with the FBI. Um, we've met with professionals that are studying active shooters. We've studied uh, and we've met with a lot of the police um, about all the different safety measures. One thing in specific to uh, metal detectors, it was interesting, Grand Prairie ISD, um, we heard the superintendent speaking at a meeting with the FBI and she said that our district asked for us to have metal detectors at all of our high schools, so we put them in. And by second period, almost every kid had made it to class. And so you stop and you think about what you want for your students and what you want for your schools and what you want it to feel like. And can we actually get kids through? If you've been to an airport, you've been to TSA, you know how long it takes, you, you're supposed to get there two hours ahead of time, right? Um, the other thing too, uh, without talking too much because we don't want to glorify some of these things, but those, what the FBI and the trained professionals are telling us is that the students who, or the people who want to do these things, because I love the slide that you shared, it's not just the schools. We're at, this is happening in churches, it's happening at concerts now, right? That the people who want to do these things will find a way to do these things. And when you put a plan in place, for instance, metal detectors, and now you have a pile of kids that are standing out in line waiting to get into a school, there's my target. Um, it's not just also about guns. The kid who wants to do something to a school, but the person who wants to do something to others is going to find out what he has to get around, and then he's going to make a plan to do that. And, and that's the approach we're taking. Again, not to belabor the point, what can we do to provide the mental health support, and what can we do to be on top of the people and, the, the, and, and, and make sure that they never want to get to the point where they want to do these things to people, whether it's at a school, a church, a concert, or at the mail office. Hashtag community civility. civility. Um, GISD, do you want anything on metal detectors? 
ongoing discussion. We got with uh, the same uh, organizations to review it. I will tell you that it takes 30 minutes to process 250 students. 30 minutes, 250 students. And think about how many police officers it would require, because you don't do it without a police officer there. How many staff members it would require? How many doors it would require? Uh, in the Rowlett High School, you have 2,600? 2,600, it would take a month. Okay, next question. Um, yes? Is it considered an issue that at RHS the classroom doors open out into the hallway? Is there ever consideration of changing those in future? Actually, the doors opening out is a part of fire code standards. Um, so that whenever they're evacuating that classroom, they're not trapped into that classroom, that's door, that door's opening out. With that, I will say with the door opening out, if you can think about a classroom door being breached or kicked in at your house, when that door opens out, it's even that more difficult to actually kick that door in. So we really appreciate those doors opening out. But it's a part of fire code and the way it's, the standard is. Thank you. Matt? Um, there's a lot, oh geez, there's a lot of schools left that in GISD that are open classroom. Is part of the bond dollars to help close some of those off or what is the plan to take some of those open concept schools and then make them more secure? We do have the open concept in our previous bond. Uh, that was addressed as far as open concept from hallway to classroom. Every classroom has a set of doors on it now. Now there may be pods there's pods oh there's pods so there's a classroom door but once you get in that there's seven to twelve classrooms connected to each other but all the pods have classroom doors separating them from the hallway no there's not my my son goes to um brandenburg middle school you do have one and, and they we are and they looking. had an incident at that school mm -hmm. it wasn't an active shooter but it was a kid that was running because they was one of the random searches and he was dealing drugs and he took off and right. the school resource officer chased him right. and tackled him right at the exit that was by my son's open classroom. And they were freaked out because they didn't know what was going on, but there was absolutely no door connecting them to that piece of it. So I do know that there's other schools out there that have that open classroom concept. That, that one, yes. <clears throat> Coil, same late floor plan has already been addressed. Webb, same floor plan has already been addressed. Um, Brandenburg, we have been in contact to address that, and it's in the process as well. So yes, I forgot about that one, that, that floor plan, but yes. We have a councilman whose kid goes there, just so you know. <laughs> Not that that matters. It all matters. Uh, question uh, where my grandson's at. Uh, when the IT system is down, it seemed like security procedures to get from the front door through uh, to the cafeteria to have lunch with the grandson were non-existent, like systems down, so just go in. So what we did as part of the bond, we recognized that the system we initially installed was very technology centric. What you're going to see as you go to the, the schools, when we put the new microphones in, we, we actually, and we got a little grief from some of the secretaries, we actually took a step back in time and went to cordless phones and uh, a system that is completely separate from technology. So they have handsets that they can communicate with the front door and then cameras that they can see. Therein lies the benefit of the two door system for the vestibule. We can then unlock the front door or open the front door. Then when somebody steps into the vestibule, now I can see them when they come to the front door or to the second door and I can have somebody there in the, in the lobby or in the office to step up and open the door once we talk to them through the intercom. So we recognize that problem too, and we got a lot of grief. We had some people prop some doors open, say, come on in, we're open. So we addressed it in this bond uh, by going backwards in time just a little bit to make our systems more redundant and keep them up uh, when those things happen. 
So I'm going to ask a question. I think I heard, and this was the GISD presentation, that every classroom has a phone and that phone can be identified to your home base of who's calling from that phone. Um, they may not be able to get to a phone. What are, what are we thinking about in regards to panic buttons um, for every teacher in our school district? So the panic button question was addressed. We, we actually, <clears throat> school districts talk. Uh, another school district, a sister school district in, in the north, north of Dallas, gave every uh, teacher, they didn't experiment, they gave, started giving teachers and, and everybody panic buttons that were remote buttons. They didn't hardwire them in the classrooms. What they found after barely a half a semester was they were getting a lot, the police were out there a lot. And they had a lot of false alarms. And in one instance, a button was lost and a student found it. And so there were a lot of police calls. So what they did is they discontinued. So we learned a little bit from them. We talked to them We said, how can we make it better? Because we want the buttons. We want some way so a person doesn't have to pick up a phone and get on a PA and remember a number. Uh, as Lieutenant Neighbors said, that, that panic sets in and it, it becomes difficult. So what we're doing, and I can't tell you where we're putting them because that would re reveal some security plans, but we have put strategically buttons in areas that are able to be pressed. And what that button's going to do is it's going to immediately alert our dispatch center, who then will communicate to the Rallet PD in this case, and let them know that there is a lockdown in progress at whatever school it's pressed. On top of that, that button is gonna automatically start an announcement on the PA, lockdown, lock slides out of sight, and that announcement is gonna to continue to play, because what we also discovered is we have areas in our building that there's a lot of volume, especially in elementary schools when you get in a cafeteria or you get in a gymnasium. So that announcement keeps playing and our teachers know when they start hearing something, they'll get those kids quiet and they'll hear that announcement and they'll immediately go into lockdown. So we address that while we're not putting them in every classroom to avoid a lot of PD calls. We are strategically placing them so that they give us full benefit of the technology. Okay, questions? Anything on line? Where'd Martha go? Denise has some. Uh, what, if anything, will the kids notice that is different this year from when they get to school? Or, excuse, you know what I'm trying to say. What has changed? What's going to be what different will the kids on the notice? First day of school? The first and foremost, it's on everybody's mind. And so I think the emphasis up front um, to make sure that we are communicating to everyone what we do, whereas before we just did it. And I think it, it helps people to ease their mind when they do know just like something like this. Uh, the things that Garl and ISD just talked about tonight, I know they've been doing for a long period of time. And for whatever it's worth, I. I've been a visitor to your schools last year. I work with AVID quite a bit, and I came out to some of your campuses, and I saw firsthand everything y'all were talking about tonight. So if I had a kid at Garland ISD, I would feel very, very safe because they're doing all the things that they set up there. And so we've always been good at campus security. We've always been good at about uh, making sure that our kids are taken care of and being mindful and being watchful. I think we're, we're communicating to the public more as much as we can. I know you've held some things back just like we've held some things back because we don't want everyone to know everything, but whatever we can do to help reassure people, that should be the biggest difference. Um, and a little bit of a pitch in Rockwell ISD, I think that better together uh, mindset is going to be very much alive and well throughout our community all year long, but, but especially up front. Yeah, with, uh, with Garland ISD, we are this year implementing a new um, anonymous reporting app that will be available to all students, parents, staff members. It'll be an application that will go on your phone. Um, they can anonymously report anything from bullying um, up to an act of violence or a threat. Uh, that is going to be an anonymous alerts 
and that's coming. We are going to be able to monitor and take care of that as a district rather than an outside company doing that for us, so there's no delay in those. And we can actually have a live conversation, even though they're anonymous, we can actually have a live conversation back and forth to talk to them, to get more information, to get screenshots or whatever. That's one thing. Um, with that, we're increasing our bully prevention program um, using iWatch, um, iWatch, that's the governor's plan, using um, I Am A Witness is one of our big pitches. It's a, a phone app that you can get and, and it kind of combats your cyberbullying. We're looking at suicide prevention and we are going to increase our random searches so they are going to see our security officers on their campus a lot more than they normally see. Um, and also they're gonna see their principals doing random searches a lot more than they normally would. So while you're up here, or GISD is up here, I heard, you know, I heard a lot from RISD on um, behavioral um, health, and I didn't hear as much from GISD. Would you address that also? Thank you, and uh, I hope you can appreciate our plan is, it's diverse, it's huge. We gave you just a snippet tonight. On the other side of the coin, uh, with respect to safety and security, is all things restorative processes. And, and that is to look at not only what a student does, but why the student does it. Put practices in place that would create a situation where the stu student doesn't do it in the first place. The other thing is, this year, uh, in every health class, our counselors are gonna go to that class and talk about mental health, mental wellness. As well, on September the 22nd, our counselors are going to, uh, in concert with one of the communities, it may be Garland, forgive me for not knowing off the top, they're going to have a community event where they talk about student wellness with uh, the parents. The thought is, when someone gets in trouble, do we immediately send them to DAEP, uh, Alternative Ed Program? Do we just get them out of the classroom? We do if it's a serious event because we think in terms of taking care of the teacher as well. Uh, I've heard from a no number of teachers, I know our board members have, where they say, I want to be safe. I want to know that you have my best interest at heart. So we think in terms of let's implement the processes. If someone comes out of that class, we'll put them in, because of a, a serious violation of the student code of conduct, we'll put them in the alternative ed program. But at the same time, if, it's, if it doesn't rise to that level of seriousness, we're still going to work with that student through our counselors to mitigate the, the, even the reason that that student got in trouble in the first place. Thank you very much. Anyone? I apologize, I came in halfway during the presentation, but is there any provision for a drill? You know, how are our children being trained or educated as to how to respond when, when and if this situation were to occur? And that was covered very early. I'm going to let them answer your question, but also know that this, just as a reminder to everyone and everybody that's watching, this video is available for viewing in its entirety, and it will be up on our Facebook page and our website. Uh, the students are trained using the standard response protocol. That's our response measures, lock out for a threat outside, lock down for a threat inside. And so when we're looking at drills, we use the standard response protocol to go by our response. And so they are trained to do exactly what they're supposed to when it comes to lockdown, getting outside of the, or inside of a room. And then what we learn through student focus groups during the second semester is those students actually want more and they want to hear more and they want us to be more upfront with them what's what's going on in the world so that's one of our focus this year is the student training to make sure they get all the details of how to respond to an emergency but we are based on the standard response protocol and i'm going to expand on that if you could stay up here for a second um so 
you know, I think in terms of high school kids and how well they can handle that. And, but, but we got kindergartners and we got first graders. Could you kind of address that a little bit too? I can. I'm glad you brought that up. So when we're looking at training and emergency training, it's important that we talk to every single one of our students, but it's that much more important that we do it at an age appropriate level. Um, so when we're looking at kindergartners and we're talking about lockdown, we don't necessarily have to explain um, what the real reason for lockdown is, but we can use, and I've done this in many cases, we can use an example of playing hide and seek, uh, maybe from a bad person or whatever. You don't even have to say bad person. And using the example of hide and seek, and you'll see those kids light up and they'll want to practice that. So it's really age appropriate messaging. Um, it's important to get the right message out, whether it be kindergarten, whether it be middle school, whether it be high school, and to be honest with you, whether it be educators or teachers, because all of those are a little bit different message. Using the standard response protocol, they actually provide resources at that age appropriate training. It's available to anybody that wants to use it on the I Love You Guys Foundation uh, .org website. It's available, they have pre-K through two workbooks, they have student training for K through 12, and so we just take that age appropriate and we make sure that we, we do it to that, that age that we're talking to. But it is crucial that we talk to the kindergartners. Yes. One last thing, a hearty amen to everything he said, but also specific to the kids that, um, again, remember the culture we want to build, and, and I know this is alive and well in, in Garland, that. Uh, one of the best ways we can help our schools to be safe is for them to also feel safe, right? And so talking to them and sharing with them all the things we're doing is important. Practicing the drills, but emphasizing to the kids the importance of this drill. It's just a fire drill. It is extremely important. And the adults need to lead the way. And so when it comes to training, like I've had parents who've asked, well, why don't you do an active shooter training in the school? Because your kid is coming to school to be educated and to feel safe. I'm not gonna do an active shooter drill with a kid when he's supposed to be learning algebra. We're gonna train the adults because when there's a crisis, the kids are gonna to look to the adult and the adult needs to tell the kid what we're going to do. And the adult needs to take charge to keep those kids safe. Again, I think you might have missed the beginning, we're in abnormal times, it's ridiculous that we have to talk about teachers who went to school to learn to teach kids a content, a subject about life, that they have to also somehow teach them about how to be safe in a school they can model it, they can lead it, and it's about how we take all safety precautions seriously, and I think that's the, the biggest thing that we can do. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, in the last couple years, we've had some incidents at Trady. We had some incidents at Trady. Uh, one in particular, it was a lock, lockdown at Trady, then a lock out at uh, Stedham, and then the parents of the Shrady kids got emails sort of about what was going on, they had a little more information, but the Stedham parents, all of a sudden it's pickup time, none of the parents had any idea what to do because there was no communication to them to say there's now two schools in one school and you can't pick up your kids and the police are everywhere, it was kind of one of those, is there a way I mean, I know what happens. You send out a letter and then you specifically say, don't show up, and every parent comes flying <laughs> up there. I know. Um, don't but, show up to this specific location. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and then they all come running. Um, and I know they get in the way, but it, if, I think we'd be less likely to be in the way if we were more informed when an incident occurs. Um, I mean, I know personally I respect what you're telling me to do because I don't want to be in the way, but I'd also like to know what's going on from a distance so I don't feel that need that I have to run up there to find out what's going on with my child. Mama bear and papa bear need to know. That's great. Um, with every incident that we faced, we learn valuable lessons from. And so one of the big things we do after any type of incident is step back and say, what do we do good? What do we do bad? That specific incident, we realized there was a communication breakdown. And so since then, we work with our communications, security works with our communications department, where the principals need to be worrying about the task at hand that they're dealing with. We are going to help them with that communication. So where there was maybe some communication from this school and not so much from this school, that communication is going to start flowing 
um, very, very frequently through our communications department via school messenger, Twitter, uh, school district website, those type uh, avenues that we have because we did see that and we have worked with our schools communications department to, in, to make that a lot better. I saw one more question on the Facebook page about um, special needs students and what sort of considerations are given to special needs classrooms. Special needs students, what special considerations are given to special need classrooms? Every, every consideration, and I know it's part of their emergency operations plan and the, the safe uh, school center down, um, down south is very specific about us making sure that we are addressing special needs classes. One of the, every single class is specific to what we have to do for any type of an emergency situation and the personnel for those classes know what to do. One of the best things is on the drill. Uh, I know they probably do the exact same thing that um, Oddly enough, the hardest thing is when the drills come around, we got to actually have so many kids that we have to sometimes make sure that they're taken care of so that they understand what the drill means and what is happening and they can understand, yes, it's serious, but that this is also just a drill. So we have to do a lot of preventative stuff up front. Um, that's probably the biggest consideration we have for special ed, but then we also have kids that are wheelchair bound and we have emergency procedures and things like stair chairs um, because you're not going to use an elevator if your building even has an elevator and things like that. So there's all different kinds of considerations and that is part of our emergency operation plans throughout the state because it's part of what we have to do. I think GISD is concurring. Okay. Any other questions? Here, I'll, I can hand it to him. Right. Uh, I have a, so I guess I could just got two questions. One is, when is the highest activity in the school uh, during the day? Uh, I'm going to assume it's when their students are first entering the school and when students are leaving the school. That's usually when you would have your most uh, activity, I guess, on the outside of the school. So. Um, What's been bothering me, or I guess what's been in my head, has to do with the um, uh, metal detectors. If the, what's the difference between the end of school or the beginning of school? The activity on the outside is always going to be heavy, so why not have the he metal detectors? Did you all understand the question? Who wants to take it? Metal detectors, the issue is what time the kids would have to start coming into school, how many doors we would have to have metal detectors at, then we'd have to make sure all the other exterior doors are secured so that nobody could just come in. In one of our schools we have 60, 69 entrances. It, it makes for an untenable situation. And so we're not against it at this point, not at all. It's an ongoing discussion. Those are the things we have to wrap our mind around and figure out how are we going to make that a procedure. Not only that, we have two SROs at the high school. If you have that many metal detectors at the doors, we have to have perhaps more police officers. Because if we have, uh, someone come through and it activates and then we pull the student aside or the adult aside we do another search we ask what that was if there is um, an item that's illegal that's called probable cause and then the police we step out and the police steps in you can imagine can't you that if you have that many and only 250 students per 30 minutes, 500 per hour. That, that's just what we have to wrap our mind around. I, I, I've heard from many parents saying, we want metal detectors at the doors. We want to see that. We understand, and we're, we're thinking through that. Any other questions on, uh, online, Denise? 
Any other questions, anyone? All right, so um, I think we'll wrap this up. I really appreciate your attendance. I so appreciate every single one of you being here. Um, you know, this, I think it was said at the beginning, this is, this is a continuous um, process. This is never complete, has never been complete in the many, many years that you all have been dealing with it, and it will never um, be complete, and you'll continue to help uh, protect our communities and protect our schools. And we sincerely appreciate you being here, and, and more importantly, we appreciate you keeping us safe. So thank you very much. If you all have any individual questions, they said they would stay around for a little bit and talk.